So I want to talk today about an important topic. As cardiologists, one of the most important calls we get is uh, from the emergency room regarding EKGs and assessing whether it is a STEMI or not. So I will show a lot of cases regarding that particular topic, okay? Um, I have enough cases to cover over two hours, uh, but I'll split them in half. So I will give some today and some at another time, hopefully. I will give some didactics, but it's mostly cases. I will start with some definition. We all need to know uh, the cutoffs that are used in the uh, guidelines in the universal definition of MI for what we call significant ST elevation. Uh, they use ST elevation of over two millimeter in men or 1.5 millimeter in women in leads V2 through V3, where it's almost, where it is universal and normal to have some degree of ST elevation. So they use two and 1.5 millimeters in those leads, and they use one millimeter in the other leads. The most important thing to realize is that it has to be a shape consistent with ischemic ST elevation. It's not just about the height of the ST, the shape is important as well. And they use for the posterior leads V7, V9, the cutoff is 0.5 millimeters. And I will explain why in a second. They also use isolated or most prominent ST depression in leads V1 through V3 of over half a millimeter as also a STEMI equivalent, as a true posterior STEMI equivalent. So even if you don't have any ST elevation, you have ST depression in those leads, whether diffuse, but even if it's diffuse, but most pronounced in leads V1 through V3, it's considered a true posterior STEMI. So all those qualify for emergent reperfusion, including with lytics, if needed. This is why V7, V9, we use a lower cutoff because V7 through V9 leads are further away from the heart than the anterior leads. So if you have a posterior infarct, the ST elevation may not be as high because it gets attenuated through the posterior mediastinal and lung transmission. So we use a lower cutoff. Similarly, we use a lower cutoff for ST depression in the anterior leads when we're defining posterior infarct, ST depression of half a millimeter in V1 through V3 is considered significant. And this is because normally you have a little bit of ST elevation in V1 through V3. So any ST depression in those leads is significant. Uh, the more important thing to me, in my opinion, is this. I mentioned to you cutoffs, but what's more important is that lesser ST elevation, lesser than those cutoffs, in the right context may still imply injury and qualify for emergent reperfusion, usually PCI. You cannot qualify for lytics if you're below those cutoffs, but you can qualify for emergent PCI below those cutoffs if you have the proper morphology and shape. Conversely, ST elevation over one to two millimeters is frequently not a STEMI. It could be pericarditis, early repolarization, or LVH, left bundle branch block. So it's very important to focus on the shape. Uh, this is an example of a posterior infarct. Look here how you have isolated ST depression in these V1 through V3. Look, this is another case also, uh, isolated ST depression V1 through V4 in this case, with a pronounced R wave and an upright T wave. That's a classic morphology. Pronounced R, ST depression, upright T. Isolated to V1, V3, up to V4, or most pronounced in those leads. Typically in those patients, you will have some subtle ST elevation somewhere else, like you have it here in AVL, you have it here in an inferior lead three. And this is the V7, V9 in those patients. You have subtle, probably half a millimeter ST elevation in V7 through V9. That shows you again, use lower cutoff for V7 through V9 ST elevation. Now, how to measure ST deviation? ST deviation is usually measured at the J point uh, and is referenced against the TP segment. This is according to the ACC EKG guidelines. However, some author, including the Chow textbook, prefer measuring the ST deviation one box, one to two boxes past the J point, uh, 
at a point when all myocardial fibers are expected to have reached the same level of membrane potential and to form an isoelectric segment. So there is an exception. How do you reference the ST segment in case of sinus tachycardia? During sinus tachycardia, P wave amplitude increases and the negative atrial repolarization increases at, as well. This negative atrial repolarization causes the PR segment to depress, and in fact, sinus tachycardia is a cause of PR depression. And it causes that PR segment to also extend all the way to the initial portion of the ST segment and causes that initial portion of the ST segment to depress. This is what we call junctional ST depression. It is driven by atrial repolarization, not by abnormal ventricular repolarization or by ischemia. It's a fake form of ST segment depression. That's why in this case, it's better to reference the ST segment and the J point to the PR rather than to the TP segment. Referencing the J point to the PR segment, so referencing the ST depression to the PR segment, mitigates the effect of atrial repolarization on the ST segment. As they are both affected by atrial repolarization, referencing it to it neutralizes its effect. Conversely, if you reference the ST segment and the J point to the TP, you'll end up with a fake ST segment depression that is purely driven by atrial repolarization. This is an example here. You have PR depression and junctional upsloping ST segment depression. Don't reference to the TP, reference to that PR point. I will start now with the more important part of the talk, which is cases. So this is a patient um, who's, this is a 60 years old lady who's uh, having chest pain on the floor and she has metastatic lung cancer. What is the diagnosis? You know, think about it and uh, think what it could be. I think it's most likely pericarditis because there's diffuse ST elevations in all the leads inferior and pericardial leads. Um, and she probably has some kind of even effusion in her um, pericardial effusion from the metastatic cancer. Okay. That's, uh, that answer was actually the answer that the cardiologist who was consulted on this patient provided. He considered it pericarditis related to metastatic lung cancer and pericardial effusion. And he thought, well, why is the, the QRS is very low? You have diffusely low QRS voltage. So he thought it's pericardial effusion causing the low voltage with pericarditis causing the ST elevation. Unfortunately, that is not the right answer. And a few hours later or a couple of hours later when the troponin came up, came up to 100, then they realized this is not pericarditis. Now, when I looked at it, this to me, and you need to realize it, this is 100% not pericarditis. This is 100% STEMI. It has several features of STEMI. The most important feature to me is look in lead V2, V3, but especially all of them, but especially lead V2. You have an ST elevation that is fused with the T in a domed fashion. So ST and T are forming one dome, a convex dome. The ST is convex and forming one dome with the T. Plus, the QRS is a shrunk, so much so that the STT dome is bigger than the QRS. Whenever you have this, a domed STT with a shrunk or shrinking QRS, and STT exceeds or approximate the QRS, this is a STEMI. This is not pericarditis. Same thing is happening here. The STT is exceeding the size of QRS. QRS is a shrinking, with an NDR wave is being pulled up. This is very characteristic of STEMI. This shape here, this shape here as well. Okay, so this morphology is very important to realize. This is what we call, this has a name, what you see here. This is what we call the tombstone, okay? And actually, if you look at older EKGs on this lady, look how her QRS was. Now her QRS is being shrunk. During an STEMI, 
we know that you form Q waves, but before, before you form Q waves, as a first step before Q waves, you get shrinking of the QRS as that area loses is its electrical um, activation. You start having shrinking QRS before you form a full-blown Q wave later on. This is a full-blown Q wave. This is a shrinking QRS. So shrinking QRS, sometimes with a pulled R wave, as you can see here, and with a domed STT that exceeds the size of this or approximates it, is a definite STEMI. So this is actually a STEMI. Now, another caveat of this that some people, some people would say this is that a ST elevation is too diffuse. I mean, in STEMI, you should have, or you, you usually have reciprocal ST depression. Well, my answer to this is actually it's not true. Mid LAD occlusion causing apical infarct causes causes diffuse ST elevation with no reciprocal changes. Actually, around 30% of anterior infarct have no reciprocal ST depression. So very important to know. So one of the reasons is that the apex looks toward all the leads. The apex looks toward the anterior leads. It looks toward the inferior leads. It looks toward all the leads. So an injury in the apex will cause diffuse ST elevation. Okay. Uh, and this is an illustration how when you have a STEMI, you can start with a concave ST elevation, but eventually evolve into a convex ST elevation, a convex ST elevation that exceeds the side of QRS that starts to shrink. And this is what we call the tombstone. You can put a cross here and that becomes like a grave. So, so this is the tombstone ST elevation. Eventually you start getting deeper Q waves and more deep Q wave and eventually ST elevation resolve. And the T will start inverting at some point as well before the ST fully subsides. Did everybody understand that? All the fellows, did you understand this? Anybody has a question regarding this? All right. so. And here are some criteria I want you to know. By the way, all those slides are cases are from my book uh, or overwhelming they are from my book. So this is how STEMI, you have five ST features characteristic of STEMI. If you have any of them, it is usually enough to tell you it's a STEMI. You don't need the five of them. Any of them will tell you it's a STEMI. So one is the ST elevation is straight or convex upward, this thing. Although it's not always like this, but it's most commonly like this or it evolves into this. So straight or convex upward blends with T to form a dome, like this. Uh, second is wide upright T or, or inverted T wave at some point. Third, of course, Q waves at some point. Fourth, and what we have here is a elevation or T wave that approximates or exceeds QRS height, plus or minus shrinking QRS, plus or minus shrinking QRS with a pulled up R wave, as you see here, okay? And the fifth is a reciprocal ST depression. Now, I want to highlight several ideas regarding reciprocal ST depression, okay? As I said, you may not have reciprocal ST depression in apical infarct, and you frequently don't. A second idea related to that is you can have reciprocal ST depression without an infarct, such as in LVH or left bundle branch block. In LVH, you can get ST elevation opposite to QRS, so you get ST elevation in leads V1 through V3 here, you see it well in lead V2 and V1. And you got ST depression where the QRS is upright. So you see here ST depression, okay? So you do get reciprocal ST depression in LVH and left bundle branch block. You get ST elevation in V1 through V3, you get ST depression in V5, V6 and 1 AVL. So be careful when we talk about reciprocal ST depression, okay? Uh, it's the least, it's the, it's the one with the most pitfalls out of the five. 
this is a nice illustration also from my book that kind of summarizes the shapes. This is a STEMI shapes. Again, the dome, STT, uh, sometimes with T inversion. Uh, distinguish, it, distinguish it from pericarditis, which tends to be concave. Uh, and distinguish it from earlier polarization, which is also concave with a sharp, well demarcated J point or notch J point or slurred J point. I want to highlight another thing that could have been um, confusing here. This patient has PR depression, right? It's, you know, there is a lot of artifact, but he definitely has PR depression. Look here, this is the P wave, this is the R. You definitely have PR depression compared to the TP segment. How come you have PR depression? I mean, that was another thing that confused the cardiologist. Can you have PR depression in MI? The answer is absolutely yes. And that's why I say, so when I put the criteria here, pericarditis has PR depression over one millimeter. But as I said, Having pericarditis feature with one STEMI feature makes it STEMI. STEMI always, you always favor the diagnosis of STEMI if you have any STEMI feature, regardless of whether you have feature of something else. In STEMI, it's not uncommon to have PR depression. It's atrial infarction. Atrial infarction gives you PR depression. And that's what you're having here. Also, you can get pericardial irritation with a STEMI that can cause PR depression. So we have a pronounced PR depression here, but this is not pericarditis, okay? This is another case. This is a 34 year old female, obese, no other risk factors. She had chest pain for three hours, worse with supine position. This is her EKG. So, uh, you know, look at it. Uh, when we, that I was called about this around 1 a.m. All those are personal cases, by the way. So I was called about this around 1 a.m. And, uh, you know, there is ST elevation in V2 with concave ST segment. What do you think this is here? I think a reasonable first consideration is pericarditis. It can fit with pericarditis here, okay? Uh, but there was something concerning to me. Lead V2, you see that STT, it's not quite convex. It is concave, but the size of it is worrisome to me. The STT almost approximate the whole QRS. The same thing in lead V3. So when I saw it, I was a little worried. I wasn't sure it's a STEMI, but I was worried. So what's the next step in this case? Get another EKG later. Exactly, that's the best answer. And am I at such a stage where it's questionable, it will evolve. You do an EKG five, 10 minutes later, you may see changes that will help you. You can do an echo as well, but the quicker and better answer, I think, is repeat the EKG. So we repeated the EKG 15 minutes later, and this is the EKG. Does this help you? What do you think now? Is it STEMI or pericarditis? V3 has that sort of almost Q wave and... Yes. So, STEMI. Yes. Lead V3 is very helpful now. Lead V3 now has a clear cut Q wave and it's very small QRS overall with an ST elevation that is in this, at this point straight upward. So lead V3 suggests systemic. Also compare those two, the QRS in V2, QRS in V2 here, it's a shrinking QRS with a rising STT segment that exceeds the QRS in two leads now. This is a STEMI at this point. So I took her to the, again, no clear reciprocal ST depression in this patient, but that was enough for me. So I took her and sorry, I have the still images. This is from my prior job. I only have the still images. This is REO caudal, and this is an AP or a, you know, a shallow REO cranium. So at first look, uh, you know, one can look and see, well, the LED looks good. The LED looks good here. 
um, anybody can find something concerning on this? Here is the hint, you know, for if you're more experienced, you will tell that, is this really an LED? You know, the, this artery is going way too much to the border of the heart shadow. As I always teach fellows, the LED should aim toward the center of the heart shadow in the standard views. So this artery is aiming and twisting toward the border of the heart shadow. So it made me question whether, th wh whether this is truly an LED, okay? At the same time, I don't see anything feeling late. I don't see any stump anywhere. So here's what I decided to do. I was still convinced this is not pericarditis, even though she's 34 with positional chest pain. That EKG was striking to me. So that's why it's so important to understand those EKGs. So I decided to do IVUS. I saw a hazy area here. I, I decided to do IVUS. Now IVUS helped me a lot. After I wired an advanced catheter, here is what happened. I started to see a vessel emerge. We probably massaged the clotted area or a plaque here, and that somehow opened what was fully flush occluded LAD. And now I know what the diagnosis is. Yes, it is a totally occluded LAD, proximal LAD, flush occlusion acutely. And then I wired it and I fixed it. So again, that was a STEMI and you know, it, it is so important to understand the EKG and not quit, okay? All right, everybody understood this? And this is the same lady. Eventually she formed those Q waves. Now she has, uh, later on in her course after PCI, she had the full blown STEMI EKG. Now you have deep Q waves. It's actually, if you look here, if Magnum, it's a notched Q wave. It's a Q and then an upright, then a deep Q, okay? It's a notched Q wave. So we have a Q with diffuse uh, subtle ST elevation at this point. Now, acute Q waves do not necessarily imply necrotic myocardium. Part of it may be stunned. So I wasn't, we don't worry about those Q waves that we see acutely, whether before or after reperfusion. The problem is persistent Q waves at one to six months when you see them back in clinic have a stronger prognostic value. Unfortunately, this lady at a couple of months of follow-up, she still had those deep Q waves and uh, the echo actually was consistent with that. She still had apical dyskinesis. So the, Q, the persistent Q waves correlate with poor outcome and poor recovery, not the acute Q waves. That's important to know. Acute Q, Q wave could be stunned myocardium. This is another case. He's a 38 year old man coming with chest pain radiating to the back of the neck. What's the diagnosis here? Is this a STEMI? Yes or no? Can this be pericarditis? All right, I'll answer it. So here's the thing. This is actually pericarditis. And that's what's more interesting. This EKG is so much more subtle than that one. Yet yeah, that one is pericarditis. The other one was a STEMI. So here is why I can tell this is pericarditis. The morphology, it is concave in all leads. You have no Q wave in any lead. Uh, you have no domed morphology or SCT in any lead. And you have no shrinking QRS in any lead. You don't exceed STT in nowhere comes close to the size of the QRS, okay? So you don't have any of those five that I showed here. You have none of those, okay? Uh, furthermore, you have ST elevation at the upper limit of what we call pericarditis. Pericarditis ST elevation never exceeds four or five millimeter. This patient is around five millimeters. So he's really at the upper limit of ST elevation. That's the only concerning thing about him. But he has no STEMI features and he has ST elevation up to five millimeter, especially here. It really touches five millimeters with PR depression, especially noticeable in lead AVF. Typically PR depression, you see it best in lead two and V5, V6, typically. 
In this patient, we see it best in lead ADF. So this is pericarditis. Now, do you get ST depression anywhere in pericarditis? You do. Typically, you very often get ST depression in lead AVR and often in lead V1. Here's the thing with pericarditis. Pericarditis, you have ST elevation injury throughout the whole myocardium, okay? Well, what is opposite to the, this is the vector of depolarization. This is the vector of ST elevation, the whole myocardium. Well, there are two leads that are opposite to the whole myocardium where you get ST depression, reciprocal ST depression, AVR and V1. On occasion, you may get ST depression as well in lead three and in lead AVL, okay? So you can get ST depression in uh, pericarditis. You often do in AVR and V1, sometimes in leads three and AVL. So that line, three AVL, V1, and AVR, you can get ST depression, especially definitely AVR. Did everybody understand that point? So this is pericarditis and we didn't never took him to the lab and the course, hospital course confirmed that diagnosis as well. What do you make of AVL? Yeah, so as I mentioned, you can have ST depression in all those. So AVR and V1 are very common. AVL and three are uh, not uncommon. So that line that I traced, look at my cursor, three AVL V1, that line, you can have ST depression in all those beside the ST depression in AVR. Because of that, again, the vector of depolarization is going this way, AVL is here, right? So AVL can be depressed because it can be looking away, depending on the exact, uh, on the exact vector, on the exact axis of that vector, AVL can be negative. ST can be negative and it can be negative in lead three, which is here. The axis of lead three is like this, right? I want to mention quickly this. I won't dwell on that. This is early repolarization, the third big type of ST elevation, actually the most common type of ST elevation. And here I'm showing the, the morphology. Uh, this is a classic morphology of early repolarization. You have a notched J point in leads V5, V6 with a concave ST segment. Uh, you see that notched J point. It's very important morphology. It almost forms a wave. There's another type of J-point that we don't see here, which is a slurred J-point, and then the well-demarcated J-point that you see in leads V3 and V2. So you have a clear-cut J-point of some sort in early repolarization. Uh, now, how do you distinguish early repolarization from pericarditis? They tend to have similar shape to a degree, but here is the way you distinguish it. Uh, one, lead V1 can help because in early repolarization, sorry, in pericarditis, you tend to be depressed, whereas in early repolarization, you may be elevated in lead V1. But the more important distinction is this. In early repolarization, you have more T, more big T than ST elevation. So you have a bigger T, lesser ST elevation. In pericarditis, you have lesser T, more ST elevation. Okay, so we have more ST elevation relative to the T height. So STT ratio, we call it over 25% in leads 2, V5, V6. Whereas in earlier polarization, it's much more T than ST elevation. So the ratio of ST to T is low. You understand? More T than ST in earlier polarization, more ST than T in pericarditis. And that's kind of how you distinguish them, the best way. Okay. Another thing, early polarization, just know, of course, it's very common in young uh, men, uh, whether in V1 through V3, where it's extremely common and it's called normal male pattern, but also in the lateral and inferior leads. It is also fairly common in middle age and older men, uh, you know, and here's the slides, here is the statistics. So, even in the lateral and inferior leads, you can see uh, early repolarization in five to 10% of men who are 40 to 65 years of age. And you can see it in 20 to 40% of those men in the leads V1 through V3. So you can see it in middle uh, age to older men even. Uh, 
The only caveat, it is uncommon in women, older women especially. It is less common in women in general, two to four times less common. But particularly, you take into account the age, older women, it's particularly uncommon. So if you see older women with a steel elevation, uh, you know, earlier polarization is really low on the list, have a higher threshold to calling it STEMI. As you know, it's also more common in African-Americans and in athletes, okay? And it can be up to three millimeters. It's usually in the range of one to two millimeters, but it can be up to three millimeters. Uh, so this is a, another example of earlier polarization. It's an unusual earlier polarization. This case, I had it here in Iowa not long ago. Uh, but that shows you the variety of polarization. This is here what we, this is the J point. Look at that notch, nice J point, well demarcated here, notched here. See the J point here. Uh, it is big, but guess what? It may be concerning in lead V2 because the STT may seem to approximate the QRS, but it's only in one lead at the transition between negative and upright QRS. I don't worry when I see those concerning feature in one lead that is a transition lead. Because between going from negative QRS to upright QRS, you can have a lead where the QRS is shrinking and where the STT exceeds it. So it's not worrisome to me that EKG. This is not like uh, that EKG, okay? It's very different because this is more than just one transition lead. This one is just a transition lead, okay? So you have variety of shape. Also, earlier polarization can be dynamic. It may be in this patient, you get an EKG next day in a different position, make him stand up. You may get a different EKG. The interesting thing is it never evolved into a malignant form. It doesn't, it never looks like a STEMI, but it can be variable. It can look dynamic, which can fool somebody who doesn't know earlier polarization well. This is another case. So this is a 32-year-old black man with sharp chest pain and negative troponin. Anybody knows what's the diagnosis here? You can write in the chat box. Nobody wants to take a pick? What is this? Let's say, uh, is this a STEMI? No, it looks like uh, maybe Wellens. There's a biphasic T wave. Okay, good point. It could be I Wellens. Don't, I don't. I don't think it's a U wave. Okay, that's good. Uh, it's not the right answer, but it's a good answer. I'll explain it. Anything else? Anything else that this is possible? All right. It is not Wellens, and I'll tell you why. So Wellens can give you that biphasic, that upsloping ST followed by a sharp inverted T wave in the precordial leads, particularly V2 through V4. Uh, Wellens, on, however, that is not associated with significant ST elevation. You get ST elevation up to one millimeter, not more. This ST elevation is more than you see with Wellens. So this would be either STEMI or something else. I wouldn't call it Wellens. Wellens, you should not have significant ST elevation. So that's one reason I wouldn't call it Wellens. But is this a STEMI? You need to recognize this pattern. Extremely common. Believe it or not, up to 10% of young black men have this EKG. So that's how you need to know this. It's so, so common. This is what we call the early repolarization pattern of young black men, okay? Early repolarization pattern of young black men. And it's extremely common. So look at it. So you have early repolarization here in V2, V3, you see the ST elevation, V4, you have early repolarization with a nicely notched J wave, J point or J wave, even you want to call it, okay? But instead of having what I told you, you have an early polarization, big T wave, instead of having big T wave, you're having inverted T. And that's the, uh, black, the, the black variant early polarization pattern where instead of an upright T wave, you can get 
a deeply inverted T wave. It is so common that the um, international and European guidelines for athlete screening, EKG athlete screening, they concern it worrisome to have T inversion anywhere beyond lead V2 or lead V2 and beyond in an athlete, in a white athlete, but in an African-American athlete all the way to V4, it's not concerning. You start getting concerned when you have deep T wave beyond V4. It's because of recognition of this pattern. So they don't recommend any workup for such an EKG. And again, old, date, old paper from the 50s suggests that this is seen in up to 10% of uh, young black men. Uh, now, what else could it have been? So it is not a STEMI. It is that uh, earlier polarization variant. But what else could it have been? I want you to think of other things. You have a young man with this pattern. It's not a STEMI. It could be earlier polarization. But what else could it be? You mentioned Wellens. I said it. I explained why it's not. But there, are, there is another differential diagnosis of this deep T inversion in V2 to V4. So HCM comes to mind. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. HCM and another one. The one that is more like I tell you this, if I tell you this is a white man and he has this EKG, what's another thing that's concerning? So HCM, there is another differential. The particular cardiomyopathy that is actually one of the most common cause of sudden death in athletes. ARVD, actually. Exactly. ARVD. Uh, the most sensitive sign of ARVD is actually T inversion beyond the lead V2 in white, beyond the lead V4 in black. So yes, so when you see this EKG, it is either the earlier polarization variant in a young black man, or it could be HCM, or it could be ARVD. It could be Wellens if it is not that high, but it's otherwise it's the other two, ARVD, HCM, and the earlier polarization variant. Everybody understand understand that? Very, very common. You need to know it well. Another differential that could you should think about when you see that, especially a young athlete, pre-participation EKG, is also Brugada. So beside the ones I mentioned, ARVD, HCM, Wellens, STEMI, early repolarization, and Brugada, except the shape doesn't fit. This is how the shape of Brugada is that ST elevation would be downsloping, okay? Would be downsloping uh, ST elevation, coved ST elevation, not this shape. So that's the other differential. All right, I hope you understood that. I want to show another case. This is a patient, a 40 year old man who's coming with chest pain. What's the diagnosis here? Is this a STEMI, inferior STEMI? So this EKG at first look uh, seems like a STEMI. You have inferior ST elevation. Look, there is inferior ST elevation, inferior Q waves, this Q wave, and it's a posterior infarct. You get pronounced R wave in V1 with ST depression. Well, there is a catch. What you think is a Q wave is actually a negative delta wave. So you have a positive delta wave. Look at the PR here. Okay, there is the P is riding the QRS. They are almost fused, attached to each other. And here you have a negative delta wave. So you have the P attached to the QRS via a negative delta, which is which looks like a Q, a pseudo Q wave. Same here. This is not a Q. This is a delta, negative delta. You see a positive delta here, and simultaneously a negative delta here. Okay, so this is not an inferior infarct. This is a just a pre-excited EKG with pseudo Q. And how, why do you have a C elevation? So in a pre-excitation, as in left bundle and, and LVH, you get ST changes opposite to the delta wave. So you have negative delta here, you get ST elevation. You could have got ST depression here, but you didn't. You don't always get it with a pre-excitation. It's not as consistent as left bounded branch block. But this is ST elevation secondary to the negative delta wave. This is another case, um, an interesting case. Did everybody understand the prior stuff? Do you have any questions?
All right. This is another case. This is a 27-year-old man. He had VFib arrest at home while uh, playing a uh, video, uh, video game. He was resuscitated by EMS, and this is his post trask ECG. Okay. What does this look like? Is this a STEMI? It's okay. You don't have to be shy. You can you can say it. It looks like a STEMI. I would agree here. It looks like a STEMI, but there are some unusual features. Uh, I mean, the ST segment is elevated, but it ha it is downsloping. It's elevated, but it's downsloping. The J point is elevated, but the ST is downsloping. It's still elevated, but down sloping. It's a hint. Then we repeated the EKG at the time he got to the hospital. This is in the ambulance. When, at the time he got to the hospital, this is his EKG. What, is, what do you think the diagnosis is here? I will give you the answer. It's, it's hard for you. It is not uncommon, but it is hard for you. So. On the 30 minute EKG, look what you see. You still see some J point elevation. Look at the J point. Okay, it is elevated compared to TP and PR, and it is notched. But it's interesting that the, uh, the, Q, uh, the ST that comes after it is down sloping. It's almost scooped. You see here the J is elevated, but the ST is scooped down. Okay, maybe I have more. No, I don't. All right, this is a characteristic of what we call malignant early repolarization is elevated J point and down sloping ST elevation, scooped ST elevation. Okay. And this is what this patient had eventually. We did rule out CAD. We did, we know, I, initially when I saw the, those two EKG, I immediately recognized that this is most likely malignant early repolarization. Uh, we, I did not cath him. We did eventually do CTA, which was normal, no coronary anomalies. We did cardiac MRI in order to rule out uh, ARVD and sarcoidosis and structural disease causing cardiac arrest. He didn't have any of that. We did procainamide testing to elicit Brugada. It, that was negative. We did the stress EKG to assess QT prolongation. That was negative as well. And to assess for CPVT, that was negative as well. So we ended up with a diagnosis of malignant early repolarization. Uh, I want you to recognize that, that pattern. Um, malignant early repolarization is a case where the, it has several features. One, you have a J point, it typically that is notched and fat and it becomes particularly fat at the time you evolve into cardiac arrest. So this is this EKG with a fat J wave that gets fatter and causes ST more pronounced ST elevation at the time of cardiac arrest. So just before cardiac arrest and just after it, you will see a much fatter J wave with ST elevation. But even at rest, you will see typically a notched fat J point with a downsloping ST segment. The J point tends to be around two millimeter, not in this case, but it tends to be two millimeter or so. And it tends to be more pronounced in the inferior leads. Uh, it's really not relevant in somebody who's asymptomatic simply because having features that are concerning for malignant early polarization in an asymptomatic patient means absolutely nothing. It is still a very common pattern in patients who are as asymptomatic who never develop uh, cardiac arrest. This pattern implies that you have two to three times higher risk of cardiac arrest than the standard early repolarization. However, two to three times of something that is extremely minute remains very low. So if you have this pattern and you're asymptomatic, you don't do anything for those patients. Uh, their risk of cardiac arrest in absolute value is only 0.07% higher per year than those who don't have this pattern. So just recognize it, recognize malignant early repolarization as a cause of a VFib arrest, recognize that it can mimic STEMI 
just after cardiac arrest, but also recognize you don't do anything for an asymptomatic patient. Also, I wanted to distinguish, since I'm talking a lot about J-wave and J-points, distinguish the J-point from epsilon wave. They tend to be in the neighborhood. J-point is just at the junction between QRS and ST, and it can be, like I said, fat, notched. It could be slurred or it could be a demarcated point. Epsilon wave, which you see in ARVD, is a little bit past the J-point, okay? It's usually a twitch like this. It's a twitch a little bit past the J-point. It's really not a fat wave or a notch. It's more of a twitch past the J-point. And typically in ARVD, as I mentioned, the most sensitive feature is not epsilon, is the negative T wave in the precordial leads. This is another case. I, again, I hope you're grabbing the patterns here, the EKG patterns. I hope you're understanding the, the, the shapes and morphologies. This is a 50-year-old man. He's coming with chest pain for two hours, which improved with nitroglycerin, but did not resolve. Is this a STEMI? I repeated the EKG uh, maybe 20 minutes later or so, 15, 20 minutes later while we're waiting. We activated the cath lab already, but while we're waiting, I got another EKG. No ST elevation still. So I analyze this EKG. You have no ST elevation. You have diffuse, you have ST depression in the inferior and lateral leads, even a pronounced ST depression. No ST elevation, but you have a very prominent peak and ample T wave in these V2 through V4, along with an upsloping ST depression of one to three millimeter. It's depressed at the J point one to three millimeter and it's upsloping into the T wave, okay? Then you have an ST depression of a different morphology in the other lead. This is an upsloping ST depression. This is a standard ischemic ST depression morphology, okay? You also have two millimeter ST elevation in lead AVR. This is what we call the winter sign, okay? Or the winter complex. What is the winter? The winter complex is an equivalent of, ST of an anterior ST elevation. You just never develop ST elevation. You just get upsloping ST depression with a very pronounced T wave. You never get ST elevation, but it is exactly like a STEMI and it is treated exactly like a STEMI. It's a perfect STEMI equivalent. You do get reciprocal ST depression with the winter, as I've shown in the other cases, okay? This patient was taken to the cath lab and he had subtotal proximal LAD occlusion with TIMI2 flow. This was treated with one drug eluting stent, okay? This is an EKG um, after PCI, and you can see a resolution of that upsloping ST depression and a normalization of the reciprocal ST depression, okay? So what is the, the, uh, the winter sign? Hyperacute T wave are very common. If you see somebody with uh, hyperacute chest pain before he developed a C elevation, it's very common to see those. If you occlude an LAD and get an EKG, it's, that's the first sign you will see. The only difference is that normally that hyperacute T will evolve quickly into a C elevation within five to 10 minutes. The winter complex is that subgroup of patients who never evolve into ST elevation. They are stuck at that stage of hyperacute T wave with upsloping ST depression, okay? So 2% of anterior infarction have a pattern of static persistent hyperacute T wave that do not evolve into ST elevation over the course of an hour, despite persistent LED occlusion, okay? Uh, this pattern is important to recognize as it implies an occluded LED as, as, and is considered a STEMI equivalent, even though it does not progress to ST elevation. Why does this happen? It's thought that a small subgroup of people have mutation of the potassi potassium 80 pase channels, which are the channels that cause ST elevation in an acute infarct. Those channels abruptly open in an acute infarct and they cause the voltage gradient that causes ST elevation in phase two of uh, repolarization. Those patients are deficient in that channel, therefore they never form ST elevation. That's one of the theories. There are other theories, but I want you to recognize that, okay? 
All right. So, and, and the winter is very different from Wellens. I will show Wellens at a later time. It's very different from Wellens. Wellens is not a STEMI and it's not a STEMI equivalent. Actually, I highlighted a little earlier, you do not get ST elevation more than one millimeter with STEMI you, with the Wellens. You do not get Q waves with Wellens, unlike the winter. It's very different. Keep that distinction. I will try to uh, uh, also show a couple of small things here. A patient presents with chest pain that started four hours previously and inferior ST elevation. We gave him nitroglycerin, aspirin, heparin, both his chest pain and ST elevation resolve, okay? So he's doing well now. It is uh, 10 p.m. Should you perform emergent cath on this patient? The answer is no. You do not need to take him emergently to the lab. So what happened? What's the diagnosis here? The diagnosis is spontaneous lysis of a thrombus. That's the most likely thrombosis. A less likely thrombosis is that he was having coronary vasospasm that resolved. But this is far less likely in my experience. It is far more likely to be a thrombus that's spontaneously lysed. Now, when it spontaneously lysis and both the chest pain and ST elevation resolve, we call it a transient STEMI. And this happens in about 15% of STEMIs. We call it self-aborted STEMI if the CK remains very low. So it's a transient STEMI and it, it, a subgroup of transient STEMI is a self-aborted STEMI where your infarct is actually very small, meaning you aborted very quickly. A subgroup of that is the transient STEMI that is less than 20 minutes. And in this case, we don't even call it STEMI. We call it non-STEMI if the ST elevation persists less than 20 minutes. In retrospect, we change the diagnosis to non-STEMI. Either way, any of those three, whether it's transient STEMI or it's subgroups, self-aborted self STEMI and, and non-STEMI with transient ST elevation, none of those need emergent cath. This was based on that very important European trial called the transient STEMI. They randomized those patients to emergent cath versus waiting till next day, a uh, mean 23 hours. And there was no difference in outcomes between waiting and emergent cath. And importantly, those patients had good prognosis, much better than the prognosis of patients who did not recanalize spontaneously and who were, even though they were uh, emergently reperfused. Okay, so they had good prognosis, smaller infarct size, and you could easily wait till next day. I'll show one more here and then I will stop. Everybody understood that, that idea? All right, one more thing I will show. This is a 61 year old man with no significant past medical history. He developed dyspnea at rest. And when the MS arrived, he was awake, but he fully collapsed and developed PEA arrest while the MS was at his home. And this was the EKG. What's the diagnosis here? You can put it in the chat box for those who are still here. You see that? There is ST elevation. I hope you see ST elevation in leads V1 through V3 with the Q waves in V1, V2. Everybody sees that? Is this anterior STEMI? Can anybody dare saying yes or no? All right, well, I will tell you, this is not, let's see somebody, somebody there saying something. Tyler said no, what's the diagnosis then, Tyler? All right, so it looks like an anterior STEMI. However, keep in mind, he went into a PEA arrest. First diagnosis should be anterior STEMI, but the PEA arrest alludes to the second possible diagnosis in this patient, which is what can cause ST elevation in leads V1 through V3 that is not a STEMI, uh, you know, that mimics a STEMI without being STEMI. PE. Excellent, Wasawat. Great, great job. Yes, so PE can cause an, a form of an RV infarct. Now, what does RV infarct give you? 
RV infarct gives you ST elevation. People think of ST elevation in the right precordial leads, V3R, V4R. But in fact, leads V1 and V2 are also right-sided leads, okay? They overlie the right heart. So when you have a right-sided infarct, you get ST elevation in leads V1, V2. And PE gives you an RV strain and an RV infarct, massive PE. So you do get ST elevation leads V1, V2. You do get Q waves in V1, V2, even V3, okay? And this was the second differential diagnosis in this patient. Two hint allows uh, allow us to say this is PE, not uh, maybe not an anterior STEMI. Uh, so one, um, it, the progression. What we know is that PE tends, the ST elevation that you get somehow tends to be fleeting. You repeat the EKG, that ST elevation may disappear. And that's what happened exactly in that case. Sorry, I don't have the EKG, but the next EKG showed right bundle branch block with no ST elevation. So that's one. Second, echo, bedside echo in those cases is very important to distinguish. And the echo in this patient showed uh, in between cardiac arrest, he was arresting off and on. In between cardiac arrest, he was having hypercontractile, shrunk, small LV, and massive RV. So that was the second hint. So much so that based simply on that EKG and the quick echo at the bedside, I gave him a bolus of TNKs, based purely on that. And he actually hemodynamically improved. He stopped having cardiac arrest after the TNKs bolus within about 15 minutes of the TNKs. Okay, um, so that's kind of uh, the diagnosis here. Um, another hint, I want to ask you a question. In, in massive PE, what's the most common EKG finding? Anybody knows? So you can have a C elevation V1, V2, V3, but there is something more common. Okay, sinus tachycardia, true. What's the most common? specific PE finding. So aside from sinus tachycardia, what's the most common? Because sinus tachycardia is not specific. You can see it in any cardiac arrest, any critical illness, any MI. What's the most common specific PE finding in a massive PE? Anybody? Let's see. Not tried bundle branch block, no. And I'm going to tell you, it's not S1Q3T3. S1Q3T3 uh, is an indicator of right-sided strain. It's an indicator that the whole uh, cardiac depolarization is shifted toward the right heart. And that's why you get S1 and Q3. Uh, you know, Q is because the left heart is pushed up. But it's not that. Neither right bundle nor S1Q3T3. Those are not. Yes. Deep T inversion in the anterior leads is the most common specific, uh, specific finding in massive PE. It's seen in 85% of massive PE. And why do you have that? It's the same reason you get ST elevation in V1 through V3. It's the right heart strain. And secondary to the right heart strain, you can get deep T inversion or ST elevation. ST elevation is less common. Deep T inversion or some T inversion is quite common. I've seen a patient once present with chest pain and anterior T inversion. He was cast. They found 70% LAD. They stented it. Okay. The patient kept having dyspnea, chest pain. Eventually, he got diagnosed with PE. So from the beginning, that patient had PE, but they were fooled, the doctors who took care of it. They saw T inversion anteriorly, they thought anterior ischemia, they found some LAD disease that was incidental. The point I'm trying to make, you have somebody with dyspnea and anterior T inversion, always, always think of PE. It is the most common uh, massive and submassive PE finding found in 85% of those cases. And even in standard, all coming PE, all comers with PE, 20% of them will have anterior T inversion. It's the second most common sign after sinus tachycardia, but the most common specific sign. This is another PE case here. Uh, it's, uh, so you can see ST elevation. This is massive ST elevation in V1 through V2, V1, V2 from PE and diffuse ST depression. PE can give you also diffuse ST depression, particularly when you're having 
a C elevation in V1, V2. You can have a C elevation in AVR as well. This is such a case of deep T wave inversion in the anterior precordial leads V1 through V3 in a patient with PE. This patient also has right axis deviation, as you can see, and right ventricular hypertrophy with big R wave in leads V1 and V2. Notice that the S1 component of the S1 Q3 T3, which is a deep S in lead one, is actually nothing but a sign of right axis deviation. This is the heart in the frontal plane. When you have PE, the right heart goes from this to this, it enlarges. And this causes the uh, QRS depolarization to shift vertically and toward the right. And this is what creates that deep S wave in lead one. It's the right axis, basically. Also, the left heart is pushed up. And this pushed up left heart creates the initial Q wave in lead three, as well as the small R wave in lead one. So the Q3 is the left heart being pushed up. The S1 is the right heart being pushed down. 